uh, to help conserve the species. So we talked a little bit about this uh, in class, and so you're going to get a more detailed uh, story about it. Then we're going to go out to the Melbourne Biological Station to uh, get a first-hand look and lend a hand in the reforestation efforts of the foundation. So we termino. Muchas gracias. Escuché que podía hacerlo en español porque para mí es más fácil y es más rápido. Y podemos terminar esto mucho más rápido. ¿Eso es posible? Sí, 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 sí. Porque... Gracias por estar aquí o blaming on... Sí. Blaming on him. Um, this is the best time of the day to fall asleep or two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Those are probably the best. So we're going to try to do this uh, little interactive or, and I'm going to go through some of the things a little faster. Uh, because the, uh, probably Katie, bless you, Katie is uh, probably will be waiting for, for you down there. Um, let's go. Let's start with this. Oh. Uh, 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 that one. This is the. Yeah, yeah that the one. Not going. Yeah, that easy. Well, it's not a good picture, but uh, you been you been at the cloud forest yesterday? Was it yesterday? Yeah. Was it cloudy? Yeah. Good. Good because uh, this year uh, it's been very very dry. Uh, actually, uh, they said El Nino is over, but. It's been very, very dry. So it's good that the, the cloud forest got um, clouds yesterday. One of the most biodiverse forests, but you already heard about that. Um, according to Nalini Nakarni, she came here to do a study on plants that grow on top of the trees 20 some years ago. She looked for some help. Uh, a friend of mine was on, uh, helping her, and then he looked for help too, and I was one of them. So we were climbing up the trees, some of the Strangler figs down there. We have to climb up, measure the branches, count the plants, identify the plants. They actually did that project this year. They're going to compare what we did 15, 16 years ago to what is now because uh, greenhouse effect. So we'll see how what comes out. Um, more than 3,000 species of plants. Just uh, and I'm going to throw some numbers only for Monteverde. Nothing, not for Costa Rica. So this is for Monteverde. They they have uh, one of the platysteles, one of the smallest flowers in the world, orchid. Actually, they found another one that is smaller. Well, you get the, you get a pan and make a dot, put a magnifying glass on it, and it's an open flower. So this is that big. So uh, they found it by Cartago or somewhere. Uh. Yeah. Anyway. Um, we have a quarter of the birds, that, I mean half of the birds of uh, species that we have in Costa Rica are in Monteverde. Depends on the bird count, 430, 450 species of birds just in Monteverde. We have around 900 now in Costa Rica. It's holding a poor, a poor frog. It's, frogs are not doing well and this bird is not helping. This is a blue crown mud. mud. <laughs> um, a quarter of those birds are migrating birds. Uh, you're probably familiar with this guy. Uh, scissor walk swing. Uh, sometimes in the night walks you find this guy. Um, and these are around here. The, uh, anyway, they, a lot of them do what uh, uh, some of the, the tourists are doing right now. It's escaping the winter. So they fly 3,000 miles and more. And gotta well, get away from snow. So um, they cross Costa Rica. They're talking like probably 200,000 birds cross Costa Rica a year. Oh. Yeah, and a lot of the uh, go all the way to Argentina, the um, hawks and kites and all that. Uh, more than 100, 100 species of mammals. Uh, you probably heard and seen this guy. Um, a lot of them bats. So in Monteverde, more than 40% are bats. And a lot of these guys, more than 100 species of reptiles and amphibians. Um, some of them not doing well, like I said, that guy is not anymore. Um, actually, they were going to put two in the list of extinction. Uh, and they, f two years ago, three years ago, they found them back. So you have to wait 10 years to say that this frog is extinct. So it's been more than 10 years since uh, we saw Golden Toad, so um, 
it's considered extinct so far. So we'll, we'll never know, maybe. And nobody knows how many species of insects we have in Monteverde. We have a lot of species. I love this one. This here is a leaf mimic katydid. And this part that it looks like uh, a leaf, those are the wings. These are a flying insect. So it's amazing during the, during the day they go on the ground and go sideways. So it looks like a dry leaf on the ground. So it's, it's amazing camouflage. But we know there are more than 600 species of butterflies and moth in Monteverde. A lot of them migrating, a lot of them migrating right now um, because it's getting hot and dry down there going to the Caribbean. You know where the windy corner is? Right before the Monteverde Reserve is a kind of sharp corn, sharp curve. Uh, a friend of mine that study butterflies go there with the counter and uh, because it's so windy, fly, butterflies fly low. 5,000 in one day. Yeah. And they have caught 2,000 to check in with, to find out what kind of species in that. Yeah, we're going to talk about this bird. This is the three water bell bird. Uh, this is a full male. It's not, it doesn't show very good, but uh, I got a um, couple, three wattles. One over here, one on top of the bill, and another one on the other side of the bill. Brown, white. This is as big as a big pigeon. So, um, and this one got a, a mark over here. We're going to talk about that later. So, full adult male, full adult female. So, she's completely different. And there's a reason for that. Uh, the guy is a Latin lover. So he doesn't take care of anything. So she does. She takes care of the nest, the egg, the baby. And so he, she wants to be really have really good camouflage. So she hides in the forest. And that color is perfect. That one, she perches on a branch in there and she doesn't make any sound. She doesn't uh, have the wattles, and she's a little smaller. And like I said, no, she, got, she disappears in the forest. Very shy. Uh, so, they come from a group of birds called uh, Cotingas, all of them in danger. Most, uh, all this group lay one or two eggs. This guy is also a really, really in danger, uh, umbrella bird. Um, and they come from a group of birds called Sovossians. The Sovossians don't learn the sound and don't hold territories. They bring the sound in their genes and they don't hold territories. This one does. So they, this one does totally different things to the rest of the birds. You know endemic, so I don't have to tell you endemic. Only found from right around here to like over here. So it would... If you think uh, you're familiar, probably you have an idea how um, West Virginia is. We are as big as West Virginia. So, if we compare this to the planet, it's nothing. There are bellbirds in New Zealand, there are bellbirds in South America, different bird. So, three water bellbird only found in this specific area. And not only that, is see, group over here, group over here. Uh, they're talking like two groups in Costa Rica. I will say there is one that it comes from probably here and it comes in this place. How do we know that? Easy. This guy's over here. This guy's over here. We're gonna hear that one. Bonk and a whistle. This guy's over here. So you put the three birds together, same. Same, exactly the same bird with different call, uh, calls. And some of these guys come all the way here to Monteverde and they learn, remember, they learn. So uh, they outline me. They speak a little bit of Spanish, a little bit of English. <laughs> so we call them bilingual because they make the ah, ah, bonk. So they do both. So it's, it's interesting to hear that. Um, six months of the year, Forest like this. So they spend it on the Caribbean side. In the 19, end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1980s, a lot of money came for saving the rain, save the rainforest, save the rainforest. So a lot of money came to the Caribbean side. There are a few chunks of forest in a good shape on the Caribbean side. So six months of the year like that, but six months of the year like this. Uh, you're gonna be uh, in this farm over here. 
Uh, I don't know if you're going to get down to the station, but this is the view you get from there. Uh, see? Patches of forest. Patches of forest. Right around here is a container where I live. I live in, I live in, the house is here. So I got the view. Good. So, um, anyway, Pacific side was developed first since the very, very beginning of the colonization of Costa Rica. Was on the Pacific side, it's less rain, it's nicer. So, for uh, vegetables, for grains, rice and beans, we eat a lot of that. I'm 51 and I'm up to here with rice and beans, so I try to eat something else. <laughs> yeah, and beef cattle, too. So everything is on the Pacific. Um, Caribbean side was, they got, they have, what, 21 feet of rain a year? So too much rain. So, um, so that's why a lot of the, uh, like, sort of big cities are on the Pacific side. We started on the Pacific anyway. So that's what the Belver gets when they fly over the Pacific uh, side of the Continental Divide. Uh, okay, here we're going to check on something because I want you to hear, oh, I want you to hear something that is probably down here, I don't know. No, not there. I'm going to turn this off. For some reason this thing is going so slow. Or this one here. This one here, no. Disappear. Disappear in the... So, ta -ta -ta -ta. Barry's gonna help me to um, put this in... Um, but at least we uh, break this... This one here, this one here. And... There it goes. Finally. <laughs> Got some fleas in there. That's, that's crazy. The sound it makes, the sound carries for one kilometer in distance. Yeah, it's more than half a mile that you hear that sound. And believe it or not, sometimes it's calling like right there, and you look and look and look because the sound comes from everywhere, so it's hard to find them. The project that started in 1990, probably before 1993, with uh, Barbara Snow came here to do a recording on sounds. And she found that sound. So she came back to record it again, no sound. So then they found out that the bird wasn't, go, wasn't here. So they look, she looked for help uh, with George Powell, one of the founders of conservation in Costa Rica, in Monteverde. And they went off and raised some money and started following the bird, catching the birds, putting tags on it, and, and this radio transmitter. So, um, We jumped into the project in, two, in 1997, Deborah Hamilton and I, she's from Massachusetts, and um, 
we kept on following the birds and catching more birds. Catching birds is very easy. You put a pole over here, a pole over there, and a mist net. Birds fly by, you get them out, weigh them, get a blood sample you need it, release them. Uh, you probably notice where the bird is calling from. It's high up, and sometimes they call from above the canopy, so way up high. So catching those is not easy. You have to do this uh, with um, bamboo poles, tie the uh, net to the bamboo, and then lift the net up in this air without touching branches. And as you walk in the morning, or you walk on the reserves, you can see this is easy. <laughs> lift the net that is uh, 20 feet long up in the forest without touching branches. And then pray for a sloth to go by and get caught. Because you know what? Parrots get first. And one bad thing about parrots is they fly in flocks, six or eight, and they fly like You have to get the net down because they stress and die, and they are really strong. Plus, they bite so hard, and you have to get them out because they, they will die. Get the net up again. And once you get the guide, uh, and you know, in, 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 um, in evolution, birds need a lot of things to get off the ground and fly. So hollow bones, or no teeth, so they lost this jar, so it's only a bill. And uh, females got one over it, they shrinks like three to four times during, during not mating season. And then we come and put this 35, 35 pounds backpack. Not good. Yeah. And especially the, the, the battery is only good for six months. So what happened is, this, they came with this thread then you put the backpack on the bird, sew the thread to the, uh, and with special thread, the ruts out within six, seven months. So the whole thing falls off. So they don't have to carry that thing for the rest of their life. But once the bird got the transmitter, that's not me, but I had to do that thing, like with the earphone and stuff, and beep, 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 and walk. And beep, 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 beep. beep. Hell bird. Yeah, so that's what, uh, how we found it. And then you have to see it because they send a signal. You know it's a bird there, but you don't know which one it is. So there are bands on the legs. So that's how we know, uh, okay, it's, it's Jose, it's Juan, it's Maria. It's, yeah, that's how we knew which one was. Um, because we, we didn't use this band. These bands are for recapture, and we use only for four sets of colors, no numbers on it. Um, this is a, what, according to use, what you saw before? Female, Female bell bird. Female bell bird, yeah. <coughs> What's your name? George. George. You know what happened, George? When George Powell cut some females, put the bands on the legs, but we cut Maria on the, 2000, the 1994, blah, 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 blah. Maria came back as a male <laughs> two years later. Yeah, this is a male. We didn't know that. See, remember females don't have wattles? See? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what happened is, what we realized afterwards is, one year old male, it's exactly like a female. They got the color exactly like females to camouflage, uh, to disappear in the forest. This is like about two, three years old. And this is, uh, what, four years old, see? A little longer waddles. These guys are around four years old. Next. Uh, please this one is about five years old six years old and seven years old so we we wrote this down longevity because uh two two years ago i always say last year but it's not last year anymore <laughs> the year before last year we saw one that is 20 year, 22 years old. It might come back being 25 years old, or 24 years old, we don't know so far. So far, 22. And this guy, this is specific guy, is 19 years old. The reason, at least, because what happened is when we cut the bird, it was full adult. That means it was seven years already. 
plus whatever years uh, uh, since then till uh, this last year what I saw it with this combination of the color so I know this one is 19 years old at least yeah so you know their age by combination of colors right so because they stand up like like that yeah. so you can see the bands very clear so it's, it's when you you say oh it's blue and gold and silver and yellow and on each leg you know what colors they have and then you go and you have the data all the cheats and they say oh this we cut it in 97 and it was so many years old according to the color they had in that time yeah by the way these photos were taken by a Rollins student these four right here oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not eating anything it's not holding anything so those are the wattles, so they get long. Oh, remember, they, they did a lot of stuff to get off the ground in flight, and then this guy comes with those things. Extra weight. I seen two. I was in Santa Elena Reserve once a long time ago, and they were like, one, and then I seen that afterwards. One, af one next to the other, quiet. Going like this. And I have a video there, actually. And the, the little yumps. Yeah, and I I waited almost an hour in Monte in Santa Elena to see what was going on uh, until I realized I found out there was a female around. So they probably they were showing off. They were like this beautiful b b males, bo both beautiful, and they were like, "Look at my waddles." <laughs> Yeah, that's probably they do. This what, so Debbie and I think is the only reason why they have that extra weight on it is the females find them sexy with the mustache. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only reason. So they do something interesting with the uh, um, uh, holding territory. This is the territory. This is a broken branch, six feet long probably. Yeah. And it calls from there. It calls. That call that you heard three times a minute, 10 hours a day, 2,000 times a day. So there are many. I don't know if they're a success or not, but they make a lot of calls a day. <laughs> so let's say one guy is calling from a broken branch and another one think, oh my God, that's a perfect branch. I want to call from that branch too. So the intruder look at the branch and flies into let's say this is the tree broken branches over here so the intruder comes in into the inside part so the owner of the branch flies over it in nature fighting will be the like the ultimate thing to do because fighting is very risky broken leg broken wing broken bill you're dead so in this case it's about pushing so the owner of the branch is in the inside, the intruder is right over here, the end of the branch is right there, and they go like <laughs> pushing. So this guy goes away, doesn't want to go away. So at the end of the branch, the intruder holds on the branch like that. The owner of the branch goes like, turn around and bonk, <laughs> right here. Remember, one kilometer in distance, more than half a mile. <laughs> right here so there's no good the, the intruder kind of falls off the branch goes to another branch and recuperate sometimes one bonk is enough <laughs> yeah but sometimes it keeps on coming and it keeps on coming and it keeps on coming until the owner of the branch decides this is a map with this so the intruder takes the branch takes the territory 100% um, forgivers feed on wild avocado guacamole these are as big as a grape so there are small ones. Not only that one, but uh, did you see this guy? Yeah, we seen Okay, this one feeds some wild avocados. Elvis probably feeds some wild avocados too. I like the Elvis. I like the yeah, the style. Um, umbrella bird feeds some wild avocados too. And do you get to see this guy? Yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, beautiful. Uh, this one also feeds some wild avocados. So, jays, uh, toucans, uh, many. There are only 93 species of wild avocados in. The, the picture behind is like a spitting image of what? Oh. Place. 
<laughs> Sorry. No, no problem. I just thought it was amazing how the picture was on that side where the picture hangs. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful bird. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, probably they use that one. You're right. Probably they use that one. I'm gonna charge for that. <laughs> uh, this, this, I'm gonna go through this fast. This is a census that was studied over here. Uh, we found out that uh, they were down, they're going down in numbers. And this year we had a uh, not many. We think that, that year the avocados didn't produce much. Avocados were the ones that a lot, next year don't, and so maybe 2005 no avocados. We did last year a census, we were, we were happy that we came back to this. A lot of young, young males or and females and uh, also um, a lot of avocados. So last year was good for that. This is uh, an idea of how Costa Rica was in the 1940s, what happened in 1980s, 70s. Policies in Costa Rica was forest, Land with forests on it didn't have any value. Costa Rica was agriculture. You know, you don't plant corn inside of the forest. So, plus McCollum is a chainsaw brand came into the country, into the country. So, no good until somebody decided it wasn't a good idea. I don't think. I think always think in the, in the politicians. It's got to be. It's also smart people. Sometimes you find some smart here and there. So, they came up with the uh, ideas of. Uh, National parks and uh, reserves. Cabo Blanco is uh, the first national park in Costa Rica. It's on the tip of the peninsula. Now there's 66 national parks and reserves and wildlife refuges. They belong to the government. Yeah. So uh, you can see the Pacific side is pretty much wiped out. This is the continental divide. There's still some forests on the Caribbean, as well as Panama. You can see where the continental divide is in Panama. Easy. As well as Monteverde. You were here. Uh, are you going to San Gerardo? No. No. Okay. You, you were here. Um, see? This is where we are down here. And this is a big chunk of forest. Uh, Monteverde, 10,000 acres. Children's Eternal, 63,000 plus the Arenal. So between the total, the, all of it, it's probably 100,000 acres. So it's a big chunk of forest. There is in a good shape. Why this bird is important? Why not jaguars or other things? There are a few reasons why. First, well, first is a migrating bird. It goes from rainforest to dry forest to humid forest to cloud forest, to blah, blah, forest, blah, blah, forest, blah, blah, forest. So it covers all the forest. So it's, that's one of the reasons why it's so important. Because if we can protect this bird, we protect a lot of, lot of things. Not only one bird, a lot of different things because we will cover a lot, most of the country. At least with patches of forest here and there. So it's one of the, one of the reasons. The other reason is it's the main seed dispersal of the main family of trees. Avocados, guacamole, and they disperse the seeds and they clean the seeds. They swallow three or four. They're about this big. Some, some of them are a little bigger. So whole fruit, digest the outside part and go like this. Spit out the seed. There's no reason to carry big seed in the belly. You're not gonna be digested. So you just spit it out and go and eat more. When it comes out of the bird, it comes clean. Chances to germinate are much, much higher this way than that way. Also, Monteverde is tourism. So we know that. As a based economy in Monteverde is tourism. Everybody comes to see Quetzal, but we find out that more and more people come to see Belbert. So it becomes an important issue for the economy of the country. And it's in the people's heart. When uh, we go off and say, hey, you have you seen a Belbert? Mm -mm. Play the sound? Yes, that bird is here. So we did that a lot and now people call and say hey Victor your birds are here so uh, this is like more people getting involved into the project so we think that's a good point six months of the year and six months of the year so this is the picture taken in April coming up from uh, the Pan American Highway up here that's where the clouds are is where Monteverde is so this is what they get uh, for part of the year not much 
This is where you are going. This is a first, uh, we said, well, we did, we did the, the following the bird, knowing what they go, what they eat, what they nest, blah, blah, blah. And then what? Do something. So we went off to raise money, and uh, the woman that uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, Terry, Terry Mallory, she helped us to buy the first piece of land. These are 67 acres, and they built a station that holds around 25 students. So that was the first one. The second one is this, uh, Finca Rodriguez, uh, around 20, some of that, acres. And the third one is the Refugio Vida, Nacimiento y Vida. I don't know if you're going there, but uh, it's pretty, it has a little waterfall and, and beautiful water sp spring. And the last one is, uh, not the last one, it's another one that has been uh, with Jocelyn help us from Philadelphia, are they? They came here and lived here and bought a piece of property and donated some to the... And Rachel and Dwight Crandall, so they donated some, we bought another piece and then we created a reserve, memorial reserve. They passed away a couple of years ago, so good. And next step is this, planting trees. You're going to be at, uh, I think, at the parking lot at the, what this uh, um, uh, nursery is. We hire uh, Lorenzo. Fish and Wildlife. Yeah, Fish and Wildlife. Donating money for many years. So we, we hired Lorenzo, became an expert on trees. And uh, we, we have planted ten, more than 10,000 trees. <laughs> No, more than 120,000 trees in the last 10 years. Wow. Yeah, so. Yeah. And, uh, and we got a donated donation from PPD. They call it PPD. It's from, you know, these meetings. So some of the countries got meet, met in Kyoto and Japan and in Rio de Janeiro. They got some money out of that. And we got a grant for almost $20,000 to plant a few trees this year. So. This is how the nursery looks right before we start planting in May. This is when the beginning of the rainy season. And the next step is to find out what happened with the trees. We, realized, we thought that the trees grow very slow. This tree was planted in 2006. And this was a picture taken three years later. And that is the same tree year before last. So that now is 30 some feet tall and it's producing already. A tree that we thought that we had to wait 20 years or more. So their survival rate is about 35%, which is higher than we thought, and they're growing faster than we thought. We work with the farmers, so they protect whatever forest they have, plus they, and the idea is to increase that forest by giving out trees, so they, they plant more trees. And the, um, the next is uh, windbreaks, see? Uh, people to work in, some of the farmers are working with windbreaks. So help the birds, help the animals, and help the grass and the cows. So it's sort of a win-win situation. These are the, uh, some of the articles, some of the books were uh, Belgrade's Mansion, uh, Donald Stab, Donald Kruzma, and uh, Veer and Thor, um, Veer and Bob, the, uh, plus some other articles on magazines where is Belbers aren't mentioned. And this is a girl that is a twin. They're from Woodstock, Vermont. They got together and they decided to help us. So every year they come, they bring a little bit of money. They plant a lot of trees. We add a little bit more money to that one and we buy another piece of land. That's what I've uh, been working for the last seven years. So. Uh, it's been a great, great help from this, this group of kids. Change the world kids from Woodstock, Vermont. The goal is create a corridor all the way from the top of the mountain to the uh, mangrove. Covers a lot of different habitats, a lot of people living in there. A lot of million dollars we need to buy that. That's not the idea. The idea is more educate people. So whoever lives in here, try to convince them that it's really important to protect the forest they have and actually increase it. So that's the, that's the idea so far. We know some of the species are declining, going down. Cats are, cats are the ones that are suffering more because they need big areas. This is one of the guys that is coming back a little, but it's still, I mean, in, in, in danger. We know extinction happens in Monteverde, uh, golden toad. What's that? Female. Uh, she. 
and him. Oh. Yeah, and eggs. Yeah, yeah. So uh, since 90, 1987, that it was the last time they've seen one of those guys. Did anybody take them into uh, captivity and try and preserve? Some them? somebody said that uh, they brought some to Holland, but uh, we don't think so. Uh, uh, in that time, that was like nobody wanted to touch him. Okay. Nobody knew that from 1500 in one year to one next year. So nobody knew that that was going to happen. Probably what if somebody would, would know that yes. something could have, could have been done, but it was like dropped like that. So 40% of the amphibian population in Monteverde did the same thing. Just, yeah. Is there any DNA? Um, two hypotheses. One is climate changes. No, no. I'm sorry. DNA. Like uh, no, uh, um, you know the Sapo Rao Hotel? Mm -hmm. They had one in the yard. Really? What did I see? He donated to somebody. I don't know if it's on pounds. They still have it. But I don't know if the D D DNA is good because it depends how it's kept in. Yeah. yeah. It has to be with special liquid or mm -hmm. one of the. I don't know if it's alcohol or it's the uh, ether. Ether, 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 ether. Yeah, uh -huh. one of those yeah. other ones that keep the DNA, the other one doesn't. So, um, so far no more. And a lot of them gone too. The hope is this. See the Pacific side looking like this a little bit. Um, we know we're not going to turn the Pacific side looking like this, but at least if we get patches for it here and there, will be uh, our hope and our hope is to hear this guy for the next coming generations and my hope is that you like the talk even when it's a sleepy morning but yeah and thanks very much thanks everyone. thanks very much <laughs> so, uh, um, right now we in the activity that we're doing outside we're not planting trees the reason is uh, this is the beginning of dry season. So um, what you're gonna do this morning is um, major trees, huh? Oh, major trees. So I do have a question. Now. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> About that tree that you were showing grew way faster than expected because of the the climate here in Costa Rica. Would it be feasible to plant a tree and then transplant it somewhere else? Um, like if we, 15, no, 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 no. Actually, when they get like this, but this big, if you transplant it, the chances to make it is pretty low. Okay. Yeah, they, most of them die. <coughs> yeah, the, the thing is, it depends where you plant the tree. The trees will tend to send the roots to the side if they are from up there. But if you plant the trees down lower, there's a root going down looking for humidity down there because it gets so dry. Yeah. When you pull it out, that's it. Okay. Yeah. So whatever you plant the tree, you have to leave it. Okay. Yeah. So um, today you're going to measure trees. Yeah, I think uh, hide and all that, count leaves. and uh, it's, it's really, really important because uh, the data that you collect today is going to help Debbie, Deborah, Deborah Hamilton, that is the, the she's in charge of the project still. She uh, has that information from last year too. It's going to compare it with the information that you're going to collect. So that's how we know first how many trees survived since last year to this year, and how fast have they grown in one year, in one dry year because last year was very dry. So. It's very, very important because there's no information at all. And the other thing is she doing like um, parcels, one with maintenance, so clean, one with half maintenance, they clean it once in a while, and one with nothing. And that way they know which trees survive. And so to give out the farmers trees that we know they're not going to take care of the trees, they're going to plant them. So we know which trees to give out that they're going to make it no matter what. So. So it's, it's a few things going on that we're working on. So thanks very much for, for the help too. Thanks very much. Thanks. And thanks for doing it.